Shalom, everyone, and welcome to this special program of the Ghetto Fighters House International Online Series Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shahar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and educator. I want to welcome our global audience from all over the world, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums, institutions, and centers, academics from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend our Talking Memory series. A special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today, including those who are connected to tonight's story on the escape from Novogudok. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. Today's program is in partnership with Classes Without Borders and the Rabin Chair Forum at the George Washington University. I especially would like to thank Igal Cohen, the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House and Sharon Steinbaum, the deputy CEO responsible for global partnership and development. It is because of their vision and passion that we are able to create this special program about a town, Nova Godok, its Jewish community and the act of remembrance to protect, preserve and pass on to future generations its history. And now about our program. On September 26, 1943, about 230 Jews accomplished a daring escape from the Novogudok labor camp in Belarus via an underground tunnel dug by the inmates over a period of several months. About half of the escapees were discovered and shot by the Germans and the others succeeded in reaching the nearby woods to join the partisan units which were operating in the area, particularly the unit under the command of Tuvia Bielski. They were liberated in July 1944 in the Naliboki Forest as part of the Partisan Detachment. In the program today, we will focus on this less known escape and talk with three people, very special people, who have dedicated their lives to commemorating this incredible act of resistance, Michael Kagan, Betty Cohen, and Tamara Yoshitskaya. And how will the program progress today? I will introduce each speaker individually, one at a time, before their presentation. And after the last presentation, we will open a panel for the Q&A. And our first speaker today is Michael Kagan. Michael Kagan was born and bred in London, England, has been living in Jerusalem for over 40 years. He has a PhD in chemistry from the Hebrew University and is an inventor and serial entrepreneur, having co-founded over half a dozen high-tech companies. He is a prol prolific writer with five published books, a filmmaker, a poet, and an artist. He co-produced the documentary films Tunnel of Hope and the Book of Curses with Tamara Vyshetskaya. For the Book of Curses, he recently received the 2020 Spotlight Silver Award for Unforgettable Independent Documentary Film. His father, Jack, was born in Novogudok and was part of the escape by tunnel, after which he joined the Bialski Brigade. Michael's latest project is the staging of a play and the production of a miniseries called Dirt that imagines the events that occurred during the digging of the tunnel. And I would like to invite Michael. The floor is yours. The stage is yours. And welcome, welcome. So I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting at the Ghetto Fighters House and Medine, and for the opportunity to present the story of the escape. And the way I'd like to do this is through my eyes growing up with a father who was born in that town, who was in the uh, escape, who had previously had a failed escape, who was in the tunnel and made it to the partisans. So it's gonna be my eyes looking through his eyes at his experience. And here he is, Jack Kagan, born in uh, Novogrudok in 1929. He died uh, six years ago. So the first question that I grew up with was where is Navaradok or Novogrudok? Depends uh, whether it's the Russian or the Polish or the Yiddish. Where was it? Now, here is a picture of where I used to live, Hocroft Avenue in London. Maybe some of you even visited there. And I'm gonna take you on a very quick journey. This is the view of the house from above. And we're gonna jump out across England, across the English Channel, across France, across Belgium, across Germany, across Poland, approaching Minsk, and there we are, Navaradok. And we get closer to the center of the town. 
and you'll see uh, a triangle. And this triangle is the, the modern town, but it's based on the old town and you'll see pictures of that later. And now we travel down the road to the uh, east. We travel down that road to the other place that was so significant and what, which we will be talking about this evening. And that is the sites of the courthouse, which is here, the barracks and the area where the escape took place. The other aspect in my childhood, as far back as I can remember, is digging. And here am I, I'm not sure how old, maybe two, <laughs> digging a hole in the sand on one of our summer holidays. And whenever I would dig a hole in the sand, my father would say, do you know how much dirt comes out of a hole? Do you know the troubles we had hiding all that? putting it away, it's keeping the tunnel from being detected by the guards. We had to put it in the attic, he would call it the loft. We would have to put it behind false, uh, false walls, into the cisterns, everywhere. So much earth. And here's going to be a clip from a teaser for a new movie that I'm putting together about the escape. And if anyone out there has connections to Netflix or any of the other online uh, streamers, then please be in contact. The tunnel. That's the only thing I think about. The tunnel. We must keep digging. They're planning to kill us all. You're all crazy. It's this tunnel that'll get us killed. Diggers go first. Fighters go last. Everyone else in between. You must keep total silence. If the guards hear anything, they'll open fire. There's nowhere left to hide the dirt. So this was a, uh, a sizzler reel for work that I'm doing now on trying to dramatize the actual escape. And then there was a book, the book, which book? This book, Pinkas Navaradok. It sat on our shelves as a blue copy and I would, I would spend hours opening it, leafing through the pages, looking at the old pictures, and quite early on, I noticed that I couldn't read it. It was uh, Hebrew letters, but not in any Hebrew that I knew. And of course, it was Yiddish. And I was able to identify the page that my father had his essay written on. And here is his name, Idel Kagan. And it's spelled Kuf Aleph Gimel Aleph Nun, which is the reason why I spelled Kagan Kagan with a Kuf today and not with a Kaf. And the first four lines... Here you will see translated a bit further on in my talk. And this is the story of his escape. And this is the story of the history of the town and what happened to it. Toes. Toes played a huge part of my childhood uh, uh, for all my life. My father's non-toes on his feet. And here is a clip from the movie that we made, uh, Tunnel of Hope, that explains what happens to his toes. Apparently, Bobrovsky was a religious Gentile. And when he saw the massacre of the Jews, he thought that it's wrong and made to know that if people escape, they can come to him and he will make contact with the partisans. We walked one after another in a row, and we came to a small river. The first, probably nine, eight, nine people crossed over, and when it came to me, I fell in, and I knew I'm in trouble. 
Можно пройти. Ну, пойдемте. Это очень трудно ходить. Это снова очень глубоко. Медленно я пытался достичь дорогие. И я чувствовал, что мои ноги начинают Дорогие. 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 that I will freeze to death. And I decided I'll go back to the camp. My father hasn't gone out yet to work. He tried to take off the boots, the felt boots, but they were frozen in completely onto my legs and feet. We didn't have any medicine. And so the dentist came over, which we had, He examined it. He said that my toes are completely black. They are rotting and they will have to be cut off. So that's how I grew up with a father with no, with no, uh, with no toes. Here is a picture of him in displaced person camps showing his feet. He was not embarrassed. Um, we used to go to the beach. He would take off his socks. He would put on sun protection and he would uh, be there. Uh, and when we would like, <laughs> that's what it was, a dad with no toes. Here is a poem that I wrote not so long ago uh, when he died. The first lines in italics here are the translation from the book. And so that's his wor words. Thank you to my feet. Thank you, my feet, frozen, bloody, rotting. You kept creeping and crawling. You saved me from certain death. Now my words. My poor feet, all ten toes gone, each one cut off in its prime. For me, the ice broke, not like at a party, but like at a funeral, my funeral. For me, the waters did not part. To let, for me, the waters did not part to let me walk through, but poured in and cleaved to my body and soul. One little toe for mommy, one little toe for daddy, one little toe for sis and the rest for all the rest. I am orphaned, my toes are gone. I walk in this world toeless, but I walk. Toeless I run, for I am alive, and now my feet have sprouted new life. One little toe for Michael, one little toe for Jeffrey, one little toe for Deb, and the rest, for all the rest. And when my father had his operation and survived the war and was in displaced person camps and was examined by a proper doctor, he was told, well, you'll be able to walk, but you won't be able to run and you certainly won't be able to ski. So let me tell you, my father was able to run after me and was a great skier. And here he is, top of the mountain. Another key word was the term shtetl, like what's a shtetl? And of course, he, my father would always be referring to the shtetl of Navaradok, which he painted in Gun Eden, paradi paradise on earth. There was nothing wrong with the shtetl. Um, there was no anti-Semitism, there was no hatred. Uh, and I'm going to show a clip from a film from 1931, taken by Alexander Hakabi, who was born in the town and left, went to America and made it wealthy there and came back in 1931 with a film crew and filmed the town. This is a unique piece of footage of an actual shtetl. Sixty percent of the town were Jews. The deputy mayor was a Jew. This is uh, market day in the town and it all takes place in this triangle at the center of the town 
Most of these people are Jews. But what for me is so frightening, now with hindsight, and we, we know that the angel of death was hovering over this town, over all the Jews here, over so many non-Jews. And here they are as they turn into ghosts. My grandparents, my father's parents, in the center is my father's sister, Nechama. She was killed on the last massacre next to the labor camp. And here on the left is a photograph, a famous photograph in our family of the tree and the bicycle and the children of the family, the cousins. So here is my father. Here is his sister, Nechama. Here is Dov Cohen, my father's cousin. And the tall one is Eliezer, who was from the mother's side of the family. And they all live together in one big house. And here are the three survivors, my father in the middle, Dov on the left, and Eliezer on the right. Here's my father holding what might be the last remnant of the, the town, uh, the Jewish town from back then the Magen David with the palm tree and the tuff that came, we think, from one of the synagogues. The ghetto, another key word, the ghetto. This is a picture, a model of the ghetto that is in the Partisans Museum. It was built by my father and Tamara. Here is the courthouse. Here are the work buildings. Here are the barracks. Here is the tunnel. Here is a reconstruction of the, uh, the bunks. I think it says Reiki Kushner here in the front. And I heard so many stories about how many people lay on these bunks and when one turned over, they all turned over. And when one coughed, they all woke up. This is from the film. It's a workshop at that time. It's a courthouse. And I was working there with my father. My mother was working there. And my sister. For us, they say it's from now on. This is an Arbeitslager, a working camp. They put down two lots of barbed wire around us. They put on a fence, a wooden fence, a very high one. So the farmers, when they are passing by, couldn't see us and they couldn't see them. Two sections were, one section was our living section, a fence with a gate. And when you had to go to work, you had to report by the gate to go through to your workshop. Everybody had to work. Every morning, Every morning that was a place of standing. And over there was a window from where I looked. That what Reuter came, Reuter was in charge of the Jews. We were standing all here. He said, if you will work hard, you'll get food. And they cut down the bread from at that time. They used to get, I think, 250 grams. They cut down to 200 grams. The Reich needs more than you do. And if you won't work hard, you will get less food. They used to take us with the police, with the two guards. And of course, the tunnel escape. My whole childhood, the tunnel escape. So this was a drawing made in 1952 after the war. And I grew up with this picture. It was prominent, prominent. Uh, again, the courthouse, the barracks, here is the tunnel leading through the wheat field and then extended towards the road. Also, I grew up with this list, the list of escapees. 217 here, although I think you'll hear, we'll hear from uh, Betty that there were more. 
Here is my father, number 95, Kaga Nido. Originally, we thought that the placement on this list was the order of the escape, but later I found out that it wasn't. It was just listing of all the people who were going to escape. My father was one of the last out because he was crippled. This list now exists in this form from in the archives of Lohomea Getaot, our hosts this evening. This is also a clip from the film Tunnel of Hope. To build a tunnel, it's very easy to say. So the decision was made to start it at a jet la chaffe, to lift up the bottom bunk, to dig two meters or a meter and a half below and start digging. In my room, Sosnovsky came in, he was a tailor, and he asked me I should give him uh, the blanket. They started cutting the blanket into pieces and to make bags for passing on the earth from one to another. There were pieces of wood which they started collecting. They started digging, digging for a short while, and they found that the lamp did not burn. There was not enough light. So therefore, they've called Orukovsky, who was an electrician, first-class electrician in Novogrudek, and he managed to find a location where he can bring electricity light. into the tunnel. Wolves, wolves all over. Like a, like a regular uh, underground walls, and they had, they made, they put something like little thing, like little pipes. The, the, you should have air. Don't forget, it's 250 meters. They put something on the floor and made a wagon, a, a little wagon, and the little wagon was carrying the sand outside. The work at the beginning went in a very strong tempo. It was very, very quick. The escape was planned for August, August 1943, by about 8th or the 9th of August. Now, wheat was growing to about a meter 20 high. And the plan was that we will come up, up to about here and we will run in into this wheat which is showing here. But one day they came, and the Germans, early morning, the Germans bought a tractor and cut off the wheat. That means our plan is finished. The tunnel started to be dug further, and I remember they used to come up in my room to go up to the loft and to take out a, a tile from the roof, and somebody used to poke up from the tunnel a white stick and they used to see which direction they are going to and measure up the thickness of the earth because it was very easy not knowing to come up or to go completely to a different direction. <laughs> they decided to on a certain day they want to go out on a Sunday. Why? For Sunday, they all drunk. The police are drunk. The officers are drunk. The Germans are drunk. Abba sheli lo olech. Misho hu ye beten gadol. Hu asma yesh. Hu lo olech. Hu olech hamishi meter gamar na hu amar ani lo olech. Olechet at alech ani. A count was taken. How many people want to escape and how many people didn't want to escape? And maybe a third of the people wanted not to escape. What are we going to run for? They will kill us on the way. You can't run away from here. And some people didn't believe it was going to be successful. You know what I mean? Nobody believes it's going to be successful. Don't forget you are on an enemy's territory and you go out and you face the German again.
it was dark all over, dark and, and rainy and windy and stormy and the thin roof was making noise because they opened it. From the roof, they opened it. Now the problem was the searchlight. And here, Rakowski came in back into his ingenuity. He started playing about and he managed inside the camp to make a switchboard to control the searchlight. And suddenly the light went off. We call a hat, a mat, a liada kir, ve chikali torshelo. They gave us a, a signal that go. And we started to go one after the other, one after the other. Shh. כולם שתקו, כאילו אתה, אתה, אתה נכנס בתוך מים. When I saw the people, the couple was going down before me, I was happy. I says, he's the Vogumtke, he's a born there. He will know where to go. And they disappeared. אתה עברת את זה מהר. לי היה נדמה לי שזה... הכניסה והיציאה היה דקה. When you run in the tunnel, you don't think of anything because you want to get out as quickly as possible because you don't know what's on the outside. And besides that, the person in front of me was moving very fast. So I moved fast after him. Came to the end of this tunnel. You, we got up. It was a mess. It was dark, peat black. You couldn't see each other. Everybody was running. One runs, so everybody runs. We didn't know where to go. We were, you know, like, like blind. Where do I go? I don't know, right, left. That's why people went back to camp. Instead of going forward, they went back. The guard noticed a movement, and they thought partisans came to liberate the camp, and they opened fire. Yeah, and that's the story I grew up with. There's the film uh, Tunnel of Hope, directed by Dwarf Schwartz. We took 40 second generation, third generation, and four escapees back to the site, and we dug for a week looking for the tunnel, and the last day we found it, and here it is. Just a piece, and now it's been ex excavated more, and Tamara will be talking about that. And of course, partisans. Here are the Bielski partisans. Many of us now know about them from the film Defiance. Uh, the amazing ability they had to lead 1,200 Jews into the dark forests of uh, Belarus and uh, create a Jerusalem for them there. Everyone of the Belskis was a different type of person. Tuvie was, they've chosen him as a leader because he was the elder one. In fact, is at the beginning, from what I understood, they thought Asoyal to be the leader because Asoyal knew everybody around the area. And to be a partisan, you must know the people, you must know the villages, you must know the whole territory. And I saw you everybody. I saw you every farmer by first name. Bertuvier was already away from that area and he was a businessman. He wanted to have a different sort of life. Um, a lot of people saying Belsky didn't fight. Now, if you would take any Russian commander, the biggest commander, he would not want to change places with Belsky. Because to be in charge of 1,230 Jews, it was one of the worst positions to have ever been to. And Belsky knew he was not going to fight the Germans, because there was no point in it. He would rather save the few Jews who have remained and escaped from various camps. He would rather save them than killing 10 Germans, because that would be cross. So the heroism which Tuvia has put out against, even against his brothers, because his brothers 
were against this sort of things at the beginning. They said, let's be separate, we got a chance to survive. And Tuvia said, no, anybody who escapes, whether it's crippled, old, young, doesn't matter. They will take him in and they will provide for him. He won't starve. And here's my father with the actors from Defiance, Daniel Craig, Liv, uh, Liv Schreiber and the others. He was very proud of that film, uh, even with its turned into Hollywood uh, epic. It was, it, he said, it told the story. Finally, the story is told. And then God, what was his views on God? Uh, do you believe in God? I believe in God. Let me tell you something. When in 1945, I came to a displaced person camp in Germany, and they opened a synagogue to pray, which people on uh, the high holiday, people were running to the synagogue. I crossed on the other side of the pavement. I didn't want to go near it. At the present moment, I am personally not a believer, but I go every Saturday to the synagogue. <laughs> and here's my father, my brother's uh, bar mitzvah at the Kotel. There I am in the background. And a displaced person in Germany, most of the Jews from uh, Belarus and, uh, and Poland, anyone who remained after the war crossed westwards and stayed in the displaced person camps in Germany. Here is his uh, certificate there, identity card. Here are some pictures of him. And this is my father and his cousin Dov, who survived. Dov uh, was in the partisans as well. Wasn't in the tunnel escape, he had escaped earlier. And from displaced person camps, he went on the exodus and eventually ended up in Israel. And my father ended up in England. And um, in the early days, when I came to England, I tried to forget everything possible. All my aim was to build up a new life, to work from morning till night times. And I can tell you, it was very difficult for me not to have any money, not to have a language to speak to people, not to have a trade or what to work on. But I've done it. And my thought mainly, after I managed sort of to come to myself, I started of the tragedy which has taken place here. And I started to read a lot, what happened in other places. It would be hard to believe that such a thing could have happened in the 20th century. And of course, family. Here is uh, the wedding of my father and my mother, Barbara. This is uh, in London, my father, my mother, here's Dov and his wife, Ita. Here am I, just came back from the hospital, and my brother and myself. And the importance of family. Here, here, here. here. Just where you are now. Here, there we are now. That is a place. Underneath the tree, no? That was a bench here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Family Kagan. There was a tree though in the, in the Yes. But they've changed over, they cut off the tree. Children, grandchildren, yeah, great grandchildren. Yeah. And the last years of his life, he was very involved with Holocaust education. He wrote three books. He was on the Prime Minister's Commission for Holocaust Education. Uh, here he is in Berlin at the launch of the book in German. Here he is, he loved teaching uh, and lecturing to students. This is a university in England. He received medals and awards. Uh, this is from uh, Belarus. 
And when he died, he was one amongst others called irreplaceable. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again from, uh, your, from your perspective growing up with your father and the story that you shared. Uh, for now, we're going to uh, move on to our next speaker, but uh, to our next uh, speaker, uh, to uh, Betty Cohen. Betty Cohen is a doctor of clinical social work. In the past, Dr. Betty Brodsky Cohen has specialized in the fields of immigration and special education, while a close assistant of Nobel nominee and internationally known child psychologist, Professor Ruben Furstein. For close, to, for close to nearly 30 years, she was responsible for the clinical assessment and treatment of special children and their families from all over the world. Her doctoral thesis focuses on immigrants from the former Soviet Union, her experience leading less seminars on Holocaust survivors and her extensive interviewing experience have uniquely prepared her for her research. An upcoming book on the Novogrodov tunnel escape, which focuses on the personal stories of the 228 escapees she has identified and whose fates she has determined. Dr. Cohen is lectured internationally, is the author of many publications and papers, and she has been the recipient of several awards. She is proud to use her skills to honor the courageous individuals who escaped through the tunnel. So I want to uh, hand over to Betty. Okay, thank you, Medim. Um, I'll be talking about my many years of research um, and which will, um, the results will be in my upcoming book called The Tunnel People, I'm focusing on the escapees themselves. I'm telling the story of the miraculous escape through the escapees, through the personal stories. Um, but I want to just talk a minute about how I got started. Um, um, my beginnings were related to my two colleagues who are present today, uh, both Tamara and Jack Hagen. Jack Hagen is not here, he's represented by his son. Um, I started my journey in 2007 when I walked into the newly founded Museum of Resistance in Novogrudek. I didn't know it became a museum. I thought I was just going to the site of the labor camp. And I want to say it's a marvelous little museum and whoever can should definitely make a trip there. And I met Tamara. And Tamara said she has a partial escape list. Uh, we didn't know about the escape list that you have in the ghetto, ghetto fighter's house. And she asked if I could help her, help her decipher the rest of the list. And I said, uh, sure. Didn't know what I was getting into. It was a list written in Yiddish. Um, there were 113 partial names. I spent a few years deciphering that list by interviewing people, uh, reading testimonies, and then I said, well, I have all this information and am I going to be the only one who knows about it, knows about all these people? So I decided I'm going to write a paragraph on each one. And that paragraph has turned into a book, which I've been working on for over a decade. Um, so Tamara was the first one to teach me about my own story. My mother was an escapee and I thank her. <laughs> um, but I also thank Jack because Jack was Tamara's teacher. And when Jack met Tamara after the fall of the Soviet Union, he had come to put up memorials on the killing sites. He educated her about the escape, about the wonderful community that existed in Novogordic before the war. And today, thanks to Jack, uh, Tamara is one of the foremost Holocaust educators in the former foremost in the former Soviet Union. And thanks to her, I've been spending a good part of my life writing the stories of the escapees. Um, as you mentioned before, Nadine, um, I've identified 228 definite escapees, uh, another five um, whose participation is uncertain. And I've proven that this was possibly the most successful escape in the entire Holocaust. 
If not the most, then definitely one of the most successful. I've identified 128 survivors and I have gone through literature. I have not found any other escape that was so successful. Everybody knows and raves about Sobibor and yes, that was also a miraculous escape. But out of the about 600 escapees, only 40 to 60 survived. And here we have definitely more than half. And who were the escapees? They were from all, uh, all walks of life. Uh, they were carpenters and seamstresses and tailors and shoemakers. We even had a mushroom picker. We had an artist, um, an artist who was the teacher of Yossel Bergner, who was a uh, uh, Israel Prize, uh, Israel Prize winner in art. Um, he came originally from Novogorodek. He uh, went to Warsaw to teach. Came back uh, during the war. Um, Hirsch Altman, the escapee Hirsch Altman. Uh, nobody knew about him. Um, we didn't. It took years for me to find out who this person was. And he turned out to have a very, very big influence in the art world. Um, the uh, two people credited for um, devising the escape, for creating the idea, are Dr. Yaakov Kagan and Burl Yoselevich. Burl was a photographer. Dr. Kagan was a doctor as well as a lawyer. And regardless of the escapees' backgrounds, they were all united in one thing. They all wanted to live, and they all thought of how to accomplish that goal. Um, another thing that I've written about is, why did the escape happen in Novogrudik? Which possibly the most successful escape in the entire Holocaust. Why did it happen there? And, I've come up with five reasons, uh, foremost of which uh, the existence of the Bielski partisans and the proximity of the Bielski detachment to Novogrudek. Uh, by the middle and the end of 1943, word had, come, word had come through to all the neighboring camps and ghettos that whoever would come to the Bielskis, a child, an old person, a woman, Anybody, any Jew who would come would be received and be taken care of. And Jack Coggan had said in Tunnel of Hope that the escape would never have happened if the escapees didn't have an address. And that address was the Bielski detachment. Um, also, um, I found that most of the um, most of the escapees lived before the war in Novogordic. Novogordic had the biggest group. They had 102 people participating in the escape. The second biggest group was Jettel, where my own mother is from. And I went back and, and wanted to find out what was unique to these two communities. And what I found was a multitude of pre-war communal organizations. And then I went back, I went back to the Iska books and I wanted to see who, who was, who were in these communal organizations. And lo and behold, I found many of the tunnel escapees and many of their relatives. Uh, and these associations encouraged mutual helping feelings of collective responsibility for the common good and, and the communal membership of many of the escapees, I believe, really prepared the escapees for perhaps their biggest communal mission of, of their lives. Um, also, um, there was a very well-known yeshiva in Novogorod called the Navarda Yeshiva which was the proponent of the Musar movement, and it had a branch, you guessed, in Jettel. Now, the Musar movement um, was a program of yeshiva studies which focused not on prayer and not on religious studies, 
but on uh, but on character traits. It promulgated courage, patience, development of trust and confidence, precision, diligence, perseverance, responsibility, and social cooperation without which the tunnel escape would never ever have happened, had happened. Um, another reason that I believe things happened in Novogordic was the existence of righteous Gentiles. Yehuda Bauer says, mm. you can't teach the Holocaust unless you teach the story of righteous Gentiles where anywhere they were, because the story of the Holocaust has so much horror, you can't teach it to children unless you have some redeeming qualities that you teach alongside that. And among the evil and the horror that characterized the Holocaust of Novogordic, there were a few really, really good people. Um, some helped the in inmates stay alive in the labor camp prior to the escape. And it was known among the prisoners that there were a few people on the outside, if they only could get to them, that they would be led to the partisans. They would be helped to get there. Some people had personal relationships from before the war and others were previously unknown peasants distinguished in their humanity. And I believe this makes makes it very possible. The existence of all these righteous Gentiles made it very possible, makes it very possible to teach the Holocaust of Novogurdic. And a very important factor, I believe, is a very little, a very little known story of what went on in the Warsaw Ghetto and the interplay between resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto and what was going to happen in Novogurdic. Somehow, one of the battle cries within the Warsaw Ghetto was Novogurdic calls. There was a rumor of a rebellion that happened in Novogurdic in 1942, which did not happen. But there was a rumor, and Novogurdic calls became the battle cry. It was cited. It was even cited by the um, historian who kept a diary within the Warsaw Ghetto, Emanuel Ringelbaum. Um, the historian Shalom Kowalski thinks that this rumor was, was started not by Jews, but it was started by non-Jews, by the Polish Workers Party, who wanted to gather support against, against the Germans. And, and, and it was like saying, well, you see, even the Jews had a rebellion, even the Jews. Um, and also uh, many of the classmates in the Adam Miskevich High School met with some of their former Jewish classmates and they knew that the Jews wanted to rebel, wanted to resist. Um, so it was very convenient to start this rumor. And then, it, within the labor camp, we know that there were at least two secret radios, at least two, probably a third. And through these radios, the inmates in the labor camp heard about the rebellion that did happen in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it happened around the same time as the fourth massacre in Novogrudek. And I'm sure that this um, was a, a, a big encouragement for, for the prisoners in the labor camp. Um, I also want to talk a bit about my whole process of interviewing um, second generation tunnel survivors. I worked with a genealogist who helped me find the children all over the world. Most did not know what I was talking about when I called to say that I'm writing a book about the escapees from the Novogordic labor camp. I'm writing about the tunnel escape. They had no idea what I was talking about. Um, one person even told me 
I have the wrong address. I couldn't be talking about his father. I could never have been talking about his father. I said, but your father escaped with my mother and he was together with my mother in the partisans. He said, my father could never ever have been a partisan. My father was weak. My father was sick. And I don't know who you're talking about. I even sent this gentleman his father's Red Cross file. It had the names of his grandparents. It had the address where his father lived. He said, well, the names are correct. Those are my grandparents, but you can't have been talking about my father. And to this day, he does not believe his father was an escapee. Um, many were initially embarrassed that they knew so little. Um, but when I told them, when I was already in my 30s, and I met Tuvyabelsky, who I was later told was came to visit in my house when I was a little girl, but I didn't know who he was. And he came over to me, was at a gathering of Holocaust survivors, and he said, hello. And I said, hello, who are you? And he said, Tuvyabelsky, and I said, so, not knowing. Um, and he gave me a little education. And to this day, I'm very, I'm very embarrassed, but uh, I see that I have a lot, a lot of company. Um, many, many of the second generation knew nothing. I would call up, I say, I'm writing about a book about Novogordic uh, labor camp and the escape and Novo what? I say Novogordic, you know, and they'd say, what's that? I said, well, that's the town where your father was born. Oh yeah, where's that? And Belarus today. Uh, where's Belarus? Uh, in Poland? In Lithuania? Uh, and I'm really, I was very flabbergasted, but I, I saw how many did not know anything. Um, one stepdaughter, I found one stepdaughter of an, of an escapee through a Holocaust database a cemetery website, and with the help of the Red Cross. <coughs> Only after I contacted her and told her that her stepfather was on the list. Only then did she learn that like her, she was born in Novogurdic. Her stepfather was from Novogurdic. He raised her and she knew nothing. Only then did she learn that he participated in the breakout, that he was a Bielski partisan. Um, the, like most survivors, I would think that partisans would talk because, and escapees would talk because these were heroic things, positive things, but no. Um, if we look at the background, um, uh, survivors in Israel were humiliated. They were called piece bars of soap. In America, we, there was another problem. Um, the survivors came to the states at the height of the Cold War, and anybody who was suspected of collaboration with the Russians would not be allowed would not be allowed into America or Canada. And even my mother, who was interviewed, and we just saw a piece of her interview, uh, which Michael showed, um, she was reluctant to be interviewed for that film. She was thought the, you know, FBI is going to come get her and take her citizenship away while she's living in Jerusalem because she's admitting to have participated in the escape so she can get to the Bielski partisans. Um, so there are reasons for the silence. Um, I want to give another couple of examples. Uh, one daughter of an escapee who had never heard of Novogordic, and mind you, she grew up in the former Soviet Union, came to Israel and then came to the States, never heard of Novogordic, never heard of the tunnel escape, never heard of the Bielski partisans. And because her father was so reluctant to share any information about his background, she was sure she was adopted until I came along. A grandson learned not only of his grandfather's participation in the tunnel escape, but also of his father's marriage and his own murdered baby half-brother. 
And I found for many, uh, many of the second generation, it was like opening an adoption file. Um, they were so grateful um, and finally had an identity and, and had a place within their own extended family systems. And um, we've, uh, uh, as far as the uh, second generation in Israel, I can say that many of us feel like we're family. At my son's wedding, there was a table that had 22, 25 people just from Novogordic and Jetel, many that I met through this journey. And most of all, um, I think that the second generation, as a result of learning about the escape, because I taught them about the escape, I taught them about the past, they taught me all that their parents accomplished since the war. But as a result of learning about their parents' past, they started to look at their parents in a new light. They became brave, courageous individuals who crawled to freedom, who contributed to their new societies and chose life. Oh, thank you. Betty, thank you so much. And um, I think it's so interesting, not only to be second generation, but also to research second generation uh, and families of survivors, which is a very interesting combination. And we've been seeing this for many of our programs as well. But it's just even more intriguing to see the connection between our guests. And I hope people are beginning to see that connection after Michael talked and now Betty talked. The names are coming back again and again and again. And um, I really want to thank you for uh, sharing your experience. And I think it's a very open uh, way of uh, showing us that how important it is to remember history and to remember to tell the stories to uh, our children and grandchildren and, and they make sure that things are passed on. But when they're not, we have uh, our guardians uh, like Betty, like Michael, and now like uh, Tamara as well. So I am going to make a uh, quick change to uh, Tamara and say thank you again to Betty. Uh, people are asking, we will have a Q&A. We're running a little longer, but what can I do? It's an amazing story. Uh, and after Tamara finishes her presentation, we'll have time for a few questions because there are very interesting questions here. You know, how many people, how long did it take to go through the tunnel and other things like that. So hold the questions and we will uh, continue. So I want to um, get uh, Tamara uh, ready as we get her screen ready as well. One moment. And also introduce her. So I think I will ask Ron if you can help me, yes, to remove the pin. And now we're going to put Tamara to pin her while I introduce her. Okay, Ron? Okay. Thank you. So you take care of that while I introduce uh, our next and final speaker, who's going to close everything for us tonight. Uh, so our final speaker is Tamara Virshitskaya, uh, who is a researcher and translator. She graduated from the State Linguistic University in Minsk, Belarus in the English department. Uh, she is also the founder and curator of the Jewish Resistance Museum in Novogudok that opened in 2007 and is located in the town's secondary school of agriculture that during the Holocaust served as a barracks from which the ghetto dwellers escaped. The museum's exhibition is devoted to two acts of the most successful Jewish resistance in Europe that we've been talking about this today. Uh, uh, during the Nazi occupation, the escape of the ghetto prisoners through the tunnel, and the Bielski Partisan Detachment, the largest Jewish family partisan unit in Europe. Uh, her topics of research include World War II and Holocaust in the area of Novogudok, in the context of relations of people of different nationalities and faiths, as well as Jewish cultural heritage in the Western regions of Belarus. She has written numerous publications and has organized and spoken at conferences on these topics. And I want to uh, invite Tamara to uh, give her presentation. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, Maydeen. And well, I'm so happy we have 447 participants right now at the meeting and people are still arriving. Well, and really uh, it's something that 
drives me or has driven me during the last 30 years. I mean, this story. Uh, Ron, please, next slide, if possible. Can we move on? Um, the story is from Novogrudok. And Michael showed you already the area where it took place. This is a picture from the pre-war time. And the building, the four-story building in the middle is the courthouse. This building is notoriously known as the courthouse because the first selection took place here in December 1941. And then behind the trees, you see this long one-story building of the barrack where the prisoners lived. Please, next slide. The story of the ghetto, uh, of the labor camp, uh, began later. It began in August 1942. On August 6, 500 better or best workers, best specialists were brought to this place. Uh, in fact, workshops were established earlier, somewhere, I believe, from March 1942, when prisoners from the ghetto in Peresica were brought to work in the workshops during the daytime. But then they were returned back to the uh, ghetto in Peresica for the night. Uh, in August, just on the eve of the second biggest massacre, the best specialists were selected and they were brought to this labor camp, which was established and functioned until the escape, until September 20, uh, 26, 1943. Please, next slide. Uh, and the prisoners uh, did various jobs. They worked for the local uh, German administration, they also uh, did something for local citizens and for people from the village and uh, for the Wehrmacht, for the German army. Uh, they were of different professions. They were carpenters, they were tailors, they were shoemakers, they were, there were a couple of smiths here. Not all the inmates of this labor camp were uh, specialists. Not all of them were artisans. Uh, for example, uh, the family of Rosenhaus, Gene and Yitzhak, they came from Vilno, they escaped from Vilno, and they were with higher education. But practically at the end, they were the only ones uh, with higher education. All the rest were what Sula Wolodzinski called simple folk. And they were packed in these small rooms of the barrack, 22 people in each room. They slept on bunks which they built themselves. The conditions were awful, absolutely, because there was no water uh, in the well on the territory of the ghetto. Uh, there was no heating in these barracks. Of course, there was no electricity. And as Jack Kagan uh, told me, he never properly washed during more than a year from August 1942 until September uh, 26, 1943. This is unimaginable. In fact, uh, uh, we find some details uh, in testimonies or uh, we hear from survivors, but even knowing these details, it's impossible to imagine how, how they survived. Uh, they received very little food. Uh, in fact, uh, it was impossible to survive on this uh, meager rations. So they had to get some food somehow from somewhere, uh, in spite of the fact that they were sealed in this camp. They had no uh, or very little contact with the outside world. Please, next slide. Uh, Ron, please, next slide. And nevertheless, this hungry, stubborn, uh, dirty people, they uh, had will to live. And this makes the escape from the ghetto in Novogrudok, from this labor camp, unique and incredible. Uh, there was a 
trigger for this is, uh, escape. And this trigger was the last massacre, which took place on May 7, 1943. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but uh, here on the slide, you see the tunnel entrance that was uh, discovered during archaeological research inside the building. We did it in 2007. Jack Kagan, while visiting Novogrudo practically every year, would always bring me to this place, to the courthouse, and would say that somewhere there they were digging the tunnel. The building uh, belonged to a vocational school and they had classrooms uh, in this building. They had their agricultural machines all around because this vocational school teaches agricultural professions. Uh, when we learned the more we learn this story, the more I had a wish to, to find proofs that the tunnel was really there. Uh, how could I do that? Of course, I needed a specialist. I needed an archaeologist who would uh, dig something from the, uh, under the ground and show me that this belongs to the tunnel. So we received permission from the administration and the we did find something like the tunnel, like uh, the uh, some, something which reminded about some passage under the ground. And then we searched inside the building. When we built the exhibition in 2007, we didn't know who slept on the bank where the tunnel entrance was. But like Betty, who you have just listened to, uh, Sophie uh, uh, Chermoni visited, Nignivitsky visited once Novogrudok, visited the museum, and then she, some memories came back to her and she said, well, when I was a student, I wrote a paper and I think that my father's brother slept on that bunk. So, Maiden, will you please invite Sophie to tell us this story? Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Hi Sophie. Uh, yeah. So we're very honored to have Sophie Hermoni with us today, as Tamara was talking about. And we can see your father and uncle in the, in the pictures. And we're so happy that you could join us. And maybe just share a little bit before Tamara continues about uh, what you found out, what you discovered about your, uh, your father and uncle. Uh, you also researched your family history and documented your father's life in Novogudak, in the war camp, and also in building the escape tunnel, as well as joining the partisan. So we would love to hear a little bit about your experience, and then Tamara will continue with her presentation. My father was a carpenter. He was among the planners of the tunnel. The tunnel began under the bed of where Alter sleep. I asked my father why. He said that was the room of the people that come from Jekyll and Alter has a poker face. My father, after the selection, wrote uh, see the things that he make on the carpentry, and uh, he take him to a room in the courthouse, give him a place, and my father make a special furniture for Reuter and Reuter, the awful Nazi sent all the furniture to Germany. And uh, so my father was responsibility for uh, provide wood to, uh, to reinforce the tunnel and a uh, building a uh, wooden a uh, wall, a uh, wooden uh, tools 
for the people who walk on the tunnel. Like the wagon that you see in the picture, that made, made by my father. He has a, spe he has special, uh, I can say that uh, Reuter the Nazi adopted him. He gave him better food, but at night he go to sleep with the other on the banks, on the hut, but in the day he's sitting near Reuter and uh, make furniture. He is the only one that can take wood from the carpentry on the uh, courtyard and bring the wood to other things, like to his room where he is working. But uh, sometimes he put wood on the tunnel that people can walk with that. So two times he tied by his two ends to a branch on a tree in Novogrod on, a, on a, the courtyard. And when Reuter looked outside and see my father hanging on a tree, he himself ran, released him and punished the German officer. It's happened two times. Uh, Reuter uh, gave my father once, I can, you can see it's a powder box. Wow. And inside was tobacco for <laughs> gift. My father came to Israel and take that with him. It was wow. a yes, special, and once my father said he received, he, so I survived because of him. But he also not only survived because of him, but because of his work, he was able to work on yes. the tunnel with that poker face that you were talking I about. speak with Jack Kagan and Dove yeah. Cohen. Dove Cohen mentioned me that my father was a very good, like an artist that make very nice furniture. And... Uh, yeah. Okay, Sophie, first of all, thank you so much for yeah. sharing that incredible story. Uh, I, I really, uh, so much courage and bravery uh, to take on that work and also to hide the big secret of the escape. We are going to put Tamara back on spotlight. We're gonna wait until the end of the program. And of course, if there are questions, we're gonna open them up to everybody. So thank you again for now. And we're going back to Tamara. Uh, thank you, Sophie. I love your story so no. much because, uh, well, each time I learn something new, some new detail, though I, I heard it from you many times. Uh, there was one question in the chat, uh, how, the entrance, how, how the entrance into the tunnel was hidden, uh, why nobody saw it. You see here on the model of this bank that part of the bank is lifted up. That's what they made. Uh, they made uh, part of the bank on hinges so that it could be uh, lifted and then put down quickly in case of emergency. Then they always had uh, some person who was standing next to the door and watching so that no guard or no stranger approaches the barrack. They had a signal uh, or an alarm system inside the tunnel. Uh, if you pull a rope, then uh, people who work inside, who are working inside the tunnel, they s hear the sound and they stop uh, working. So there were many arrangements around the, this tunnel work, and mainly the work was done at night. Uh, well, the Negnevitsky story is not finished. Uh, I don't think we have time to uh, speak about it, but there was the third brother who Moshe didn't manage to save his life. Mm -hmm. 
Let's move to the next slide, please, because the tunnel story deserves to be uh, spoken, to be described by those who did it. You see here how we left the barrack and we move now along the tunnel pass. We marked this tunnel pass on top of the ground, although it is there under the ground. All this area was in trenches in 2012 when we searched for the tunnel. And I must uh, admit that we didn't find it here. The tunnel is completely lost behind the trees. In this open area, it doesn't exist. But we plan to lay a very special garden around, uh, around the tunnel pass. And here you see a memorial sign to a girl, to Michle Sosnowski. This memorial sign was unveiled in 2019. Uh, and we call it a memorial sign to a wish to live. This beautiful girl, we have a picture of Michle in the exhibition, was 10 years older than in the picture and 10 years older than she looks here in this bronze sculpture. She died. She escaped from the ghetto before the tunnel, but she was recognized in the street and denounced and uh, together with her friend, they were both arrested and died in prison. But we want to speak about wishes of the prisoners. This girl wanted to leave, to escape, to join the partisans. We want other sculptures, other monuments, to a boy without toes, Jack Kagan, uh, who survived, he told me, he survived, because he always wanted to know how it would finish, and when it finishes. He wanted many fresh rolls with butter. So a boy without toes eating a fresh, uh, fresh bread uh, and smiling happy is my dream. We, uh, so that we have this story embo embodied, you know, in some material which will last forever. It was mentioned already, the tunnel is long. No, not this. The, the tunnel is long, please, uh, to the previous slide. Ron, I want this one. Yes, thank you. Uh, we found the tunnel, really, in 2012, very close to the exit. And now we have uh, two pieces of the tunnel preserved and covered with this uh, glass construction so that you can see how it looks like today. And we have this outdoor exhibition, which is called uh, the story of the tunnel and, it, and of the escape as told by its participants. So please, next slide. And I will uh, give voice now to those who did it. So the trigger, and the next please, the trigger for the tunnel was the massacre on May 7, 1943. Wrong, please, next slide, so that people can read. They took 250 women to be shot. Among them were my wife Hinda and niece Tamara, my brother's wife and son, and Daniel Ostashinsky's mother with three children. This execution was carried out near the court. The victims were forced to lie face down. They took 10 people, shot and threw them into the pit. Those who were in the ghetto could see the massacre. I saw how my wife and others were shot. I saw my brother's wife, she died holding her son's hand. On that day, 250 women and 45 men were shot, not counting the children. This is what Zaydel Kushner, Zaydel Naum Kushner wrote in his testimony. And this massacre was different from previous because people who were locked in the court building they could see through big windows how their family members were killed. That's why they reacted differently to this massacre. They got angry. The ang this anger made them act. And within three days, the project to dig a tunnel was approved. 
Beryl Yuselevich was appointed a technical manager of the project. The structural supervisor was Isaac Dvoretsky, Heim Lebovitz wrote in, in his testimony. Uh, there are many people, uh, next slide please, and then next slide. Uh, there are uh, at least four people whom this idea to dig a tunnel is uh, uh, addressed to. But uh, Zaydel uh, Kushner wrote that this idea was first voiced by a shoemaker, Rachmiel. He also gives figures how many people were in the ghetto at that time. 232 Jews remained in the ghetto. And only 12 people supported the idea at the beginning, which is very important because when the, you heard Jack speaking about the tunnel and, and um, other people, well, it looks like everybody supported this idea. Not, nothing of the kind. Uh, 50 people were selected. They were young and we hoped they could keep the work confidential. 50 people were selected to dig the tunnel. Uh, well, I believe that they really wanted to do that. But uh, the shortest and the strongest were selected. And probably not all of them really agreed to this idea at the beginning. There was a problem with um, finding food for these um, people. And um, there was a problem with organizing everything so that there was no rush and there was discipline. Salak Yakubovich, who was the head of the Jewish police in the ghetto, the chief of the police, he was responsible for appointing diggers and for people to find extra food for them. For example, um, Mordukhovitz, who was responsible for bringing bread to the ghetto from the bakery, which was outside, uh, he wrote that he could always have an extra piece of bread and sometimes even butter to his bread, so he could share with others. There were other ways, please, next slide. Other ways how uh, food was delivered to the ghetto. And please, next. With food, this handful of Jews in the ghetto settled in such a way that they received it through the local police which for a good bribe bought food and secretly passed the, uh, through the fence to the ghetto at night. Sarah Yakubovitz wrote in her testimony and her testimony is to be found in Warsaw in the Jewish Historical Institute. Uh, the guards were local guys, local young men, Pol Poles and Belarusians. And many knew Jews who were incarcerated in the camp from before the war. For example, Fania Dunitz, Betty's mother, uh, she spoke about a Belarusian young man from her town, from Zhetl, who was also a guard in that ghetto. And he was really good uh, to her. He uh, wanted to help. He arranged an escape uh, for Fania's brother. Uh, and he suggested Fania to escape. You know, one day, all the 24 guards left uh, for the partisans, left for the forest. And they invited two Jews, including Fania. Fania was one of them. But nobody trusted anybody and uh, nobody went with them. There was a question in, uh, in the chat how long they worked. How long uh, were they digging the tunnel? Uh, Zaydel Kushner writes, it took three months and two days. Well, we know that they started, as Jack would say, um, a couple of weeks after the massacre. So some time in May, in the second half of May. We know that the tunnel was ready uh, around uh, September 20, 1943. So that's the time 
uh, they were working and there were few nights when they didn't work. Practically every night they worked in the tunnel. Please, next slide. Uh, please uh, go on. I would like to uh, present you now a piece from a documentary made by uh, Belarus Film in Belarus. They made this reconstruction of how the tunnel was constructed and how the earth, the dirt from the tunnel was hidden. You see the supports inside the tunnel, wooden planks. They also made rails for the trolley. And here inside the building, in small sacks, they pass the dirt from the tunnel to each other. And then they hid it in the loft between the ceiling and the roof and between fake walls that were built inside this building, inside this room. The question of instruments, the question with what instruments they were digging. And next, please. Uh, Bata Rabinovitz, Fania's friend from Jettel, she wrote that we dug the tunnel with instruments taken by the people from their workplaces, for example, from the carpentry shop. They took them at night and returned in the morning. Another specialist, Leiba Pinchuk, uh, wrote that uh, uh, Smiths made special blades with a sharp head and a short handle. Also buckets were made to pull the earth out of the tunnel. But when the tunnel became long, they had to build a trolley. Uh, buckets were not useful anymore. The electrician, Avram Rakovsky, he uh, installed electricity inside the tunnel. And two people worked in the tunnel at a time. Here you see one couple, Shaul Gorodinsky and Hanan Kushner. They worked together. These pictures are from before the war and right after the war. So you can imagine how old the tunnel diggers were. Uh, how, uh, Shaul Gorodinsky survived the escape, Han and Kushner didn't. So Shaul wrote that they worked from three to five hours in turn. And the depth of the tunnel was 1.5 meters. In fact, uh, the tunnel, most testimonies say that the tunnel was only 70 to 70 centimeters. Mainly uh, men uh, were working inside the tunnel, but um, uh, in th uh, there were, um, everybody took part in this project, either providing food to the tunnel diggers or hiding the dirt that was taken out of the tunnel or watching, uh, to keep it in secret. And to keep the whole project in secret was even more difficult than to dig because nobody trusted anybody and everybody watched everybody. And uh, this was, the reason for this was that many people didn't believe in the success. And when the tunnel was ready, they, uh, they uh, escape was planned and it happened so that many people didn't want to go into the tunnel. So the organizers, and there was a sort of committee which was headed by um, Beryl Yoselevich, who was appointed a, the technical manager of the project. Uh, they 
uh, ordered to vote. And there was a secret ballot conducted. And the results of the ballot were 165 uh, for the escape and 65 against the escape. Yet it was decided to escape. The escape was organized and planned so well, they even made, uh, gave uh, a try to some people before the escape, and they calculated that the whole escape would last 48 minutes. The day, September 26, 1943, was their third attempt to escape. The first night was too uh, moonlit. They uh, postponed the escape. The second, people didn't want to go into the tunnel. And only on the third night, which was there was a tempest, it was raining. We began to organize for the escape and we were told, everybody was told who he would follow. Shaul Gorodinsky gives his number and uh, Hanan Kushner's number. So uh, they played with electricity so that uh, the camp was absolutely dark. Uh, but uh, Rabinovitz remembers um, that 10 workers, oh, no, Labour Pinchuk, sorry, that 10 workers went into the tunnel first. They were to dig the exit because it was not open, it hadn't been opened before, and put stairs that had been prepared in advance. They were followed by five guards armed with pistols and two people from the committee. Five people also armed with pistols and the rest of the committee stood at the entrance. You see, the escape was controlled from the first minute to the very last minute. And those who didn't want to go into the tunnel, they were made, in fact, to go. And yet there were six, uh, as they call, clever uh, Jews who didn't go into the tunnel. Israel Kalachik was one of them. And they were hiding for eight days in the earth from the tunnel hidden in the loft. And when uh, the camp was no longer guarded, they left the camp, uh, left this, um, the town, and also found the way, their way to the Belskis. Please, next slide. Uh, the escape really was uh, very difficult because the tunnel, which was very small, was full of people. We had to crawl. There was bare earth and rails for the trolley inside in which the sand was taken out. The walls were supported by boards. Small metal tubes were inserted for air at the top. They solved this problem with air earlier and Lonka Partnoy, he was the one who suggested to put uh, pipes from the inside so that uh, air would come into the tunnel. It was very hard to crawl. There was light inside, but it was terribly suffocating. Within one hour, all the Jews were out. The last were the members of the fighting organization. A few clever people hid in the ghetto by Eliyahu Berkovitz. And uh, the tunnel, the escape was discovered during the escape. Uh, the police came into the building, please next slide, and they discovered uh, that there was nobody inside. They heard people speaking, shouting, crying uh, while when they were coming out of the tunnel and they started shooting. Uh, Yet, we call it the most successful escape because more than half of the prisoners survived this escape. Some were caught by bullets uh, while coming out of the tunnel, like Hanan Kushner, for example. Others who, who didn't survive the escape, they were found on the next day when the police and Germans searched for, for the escapees. 
Uh, yet, uh, we know that those who survived, more than 100 people, they joined the Belsky partisans. Uh, I mentioned already that the chief of the police, Salak Yakubovic, he was part of resistance. Another person who was uh, the chairman of the Judenrat in the ghetto in Tvokrudok, Daniel Ostashinsky, he was also a member of the resistance. And unlike in other ghettos, uh, the leaders of the labor camp, they were with all the people, with all the inmates of the ghetto, and the escape was meant for everybody. Uh, the tunnel was never discovered because the work in the ghetto workshops was never neglected, so the output never dropped. In addition, the sanitary conditions within the sleeping quarters were so appalling, the guards never entered leaving us to dig in secret, said El Kushner wrote. And uh, Daniel Ostashinsky, uh, while reflecting on the success of the escape, he wrote that all ideas were suggested by people who didn't have technical knowledge. Indeed, they uh, hadn't been trained, you know, for digging tunnels. Everything came from common understanding of specialists and ordinary people. It simply inspired them to complete the tasks. There's no doubt that everybody invested one's professional experience and contributed to the common cause. So that's how it happened. Uh, at the end of the tunnel in 2019, we built a memorial wall with the name plaques for all the tunnel escapees. Uh, it was possible, it became possible because of the contribution of uh, Cyril and Charles Kushner Foundation. I'm really grateful for that. And it became possible thanks to Betty Cohen's research because uh, she was the only one who, who could help me to define who survived and who didn't survive the escape. This was very important for the project because my idea was to mark in a different way those who survived and those who didn't. As Betty said, the success of the escape and the uh, success of the Belsky partisans could have never happened. And that was what Jack Kagan uh, repeated many times, if not, the non-Jews who helped the Jews to survive. And we have this garden next to the wall to commemorate those brave people. 10 families have the title of the righteous among nations. Yet I would like to stress that there is one person who didn't survive the escape, but whom everybody who did owe their lives, Beryl Yoselevitz. Uh, let me remind you that only 12 people at the beginning supported the idea of the escape. And uh, Dr. Cohen, who was in charge of the resistance group in the ghetto, he didn't believe in it and he said, I won't do it. Bel Yoselevich, a photographer from Novogrudok, he said, let's do it. And he was appointed a technical manager and he led all the project from the beginning to the end. We don't have his picture, proper picture, only from the Maccabi Novogrudok football team. He is the third on the left on this picture. And the last, please, the reasons why Novogrudok and the escape is so special. First of all, my uh, opinion is that because the Jewish community in Novogrudok was well structured and organized before the war, they managed to do it in the ghetto, to organize themselves and uh, to have a successful uh, resistance group. Young people, and all of them were young, they were active members in community life before the war.
So Daniel Ostashinsky, we know, and uh, uh, those who were involved in different sports activities, they really were very active and we can mm -hmm. see it from, from the film Novogrodok 1931, which is on the internet. Everybody can watch it. Uh, many of them graduated from a Tarbot school and they really knew what Jewish pride means and they knew how to fight back. The Judenrat and the Jewish police were part of resistance and this played an important role. And the tun we know about many tunnels in many places which were intended for small groups of people, for leaders, for small groups. In Novogrudok, the tunnel was for everybody. So this was one of the uh, special characteristics of the tunnel. It was an open secret. Everybody knew about it, but everybody knew that if they say a word about it, they would be killed by the Jews in the ghetto. And uh, that's how uh, it worked. It finally brought to a success. And Jack Kagan, was the only one who came to visit after the collapse of the Soviet Union and who would come again and again and bring other people and would uh, do everything, he did everything for this story to become known and to be preserved, to be commemorated. Well, whether it was the instinct of self-preservation as Ray Kushner said, or a miracle, as Jack Kagan said, it happened. So thank you very much. And please stay in touch, everybody who is connected to the story. Thank you very much, Tamara. I have to say that uh, we knew that this program was special. I knew that I had three Balabuster and very important people that were speaking today. And I knew that it, we were going to run over. So I want to say, Sorry that I cut people off. I know people are angry at me right now, but you know what? I already said to all three, I think we need to have another program because it wasn't enough, but I hope that people did get this sense. I think what Tamara said and Betty said and also Michael said, we're talking about a community that I feel it today. It's still a strong community. The second generation survivors and Tamara herself with all of her commitment to preserving this history of Novogodok and what happened to the Jewish community. It's an amazing and incredible story. And I wanna remind everybody that you will get a recording of this program. So don't worry about that. And all the tech problems will be taken out. We did have a few questions. Actually, Tamara answered a few of the questions that were coming through. I just wanna mention that um, there is someone in the audience that is related to Israel uh, Kalachik, 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 Kalachik. Uh, Jeanette Heinstein, she said she's a first cousin. And there was also another, uh, someone who was related to Borowski, I think, that all, I think it was grandfather. So we have a lot of the uh, Novogodok uh, community uh, uh, next generations with us today. And I'm so glad that they were with us. Um, how the tunnel was created was one of the questions. And I think we got an, a wonderful answer. Um, also, uh, there was a question uh, about what happened to those that didn't escape? Uh, because that's the story of, of Novogodok itself, the community. And I think that maybe that will be the one question that we will ask before we say uh, good night here in Israel, <laughs> good morning and good afternoon everywhere else. And I wanna uh, put that question to all three of our guests, uh, what you know about the, the, those that didn't survive. And one last thing before I ask this question, some people wanted the list. They wanted to know the names on the list. Now we have the list with the names written uh, by hand, handwritten, but uh, Tamara, do you have a list, a written list of all the people? I'm sure Betty does as well. Yeah. Right, so Betty and Michael, please open your microphones. Um, and uh, the question about the list, first of all, Tamara, do you have a written list? A printout I have list? it from Betty. From Betty, so Betty has a list, okay. This that was made uh, for the memorial wall in 2019, um, 
there's been so many new developments, so many new discoveries um, that has to be changed, but um, uh, the claims conference uh, who is supporting me um, <laughs> has, uh, does not want me to give it out until publication of my book, which will oh. be very will, which will be within a very short time, I hope. Okay, so we got an answer about the list because people want to check. So my one question that I do want to ask, and before I ask, I've been reminded now that Aaron Bell, Aaron Bielski is with us today. So I want to welcome him. Uh, the last uh, Bielski brother uh, still, sir, that is still alive and I see him with his uh, wife. I see him, I don't know if everybody sees him like I do. So welcome. Um, so my question is what you know about those that didn't escape? What happened to the rest of the community in Novi Bod? Uh, as I said already, uh, only six people, or, or maybe a bit more, but we know about six people. They hid in the loft, in the sand from the tunnel, and sat there for eight days. And when the guards were arrested and uh, when the, uh, the camp was not guarded, they left the camp and all of them survived with the Belskis till the end of the war. Oh, now we see Aaron and Henry. Now we see Aaron. Hi, Shalom. Shalom. Uh, well, um, not everybody who joined the partisans survived. Some of them were killed on the way to the partisans. Uh, three people arrived at a Russian partisan detachment and they were killed because they didn't uh, agree to give away their guns. They had a rifle or, or a pistol, I don't know exactly what, so they were killed. Uh, some of them were killed later in the partisans. They fell uh, while performing duties. 11 people were killed the very last day. Right. It was a German ambush, the very last day, bef one day before liberation. Uh, 11 people were were killed. That was in the Belsky camp. That was another story. Camp, right. I'd like to make a comment. Okay, we're um, Michael, and we'll finish with you. Yes, okay. Michael. Thank you. Um, in the chat, people recall the film, The Great Escape. Everyone remembers the gate. Yeah, the <laughs> I saw that. I'm not going to try and sing the tune, but it's a very famous tune, Steve McQueen and everybody else. Um, I call this escape the greatest escape. The and greatest. It's not really fair, and I, I don't mean it's not a judgment. Every escape was great. Um, the great escape was from a special stalag that was built for officer POWs from uh, from the Allies, and it was the Gen Geneva Convention that they were expected to escape, and if they were caught, they were put back, and then they were expected to escape again. And uh, in one night. 74 of them managed to get through their tunnel. They all had, uh, they were all well fed. They had identity cards and, and disguises and they managed to disperse. I think only two made it out of Europe and survived. The rest were brought back. 50 of them were taken away in the infamous story and, and massacred on orders of Hitler and the rest went back into the camp to try and escape the game. Um, there's a huge difference between a labor death camp and everything that we've been describing and POWs escaping. Um, but when you watch the film and you watch the dramat dramatization that Tamara showed, mm -hmm. it looks very similar. You have to shift the earth. You have to get air in. You have to get light in. You have to make sure it's straight. So there, there are strong parallels, but uh, as Betty told us, 230. Right. Escaped. The whole camp, oh, that was the other point. The whole camp escaped, except for the few who stayed hidden. So it wasn't like 73 out of. The entire camp was emptied, the Germans came in, the next day, saw that it was empty, brought in trucks, loaded the machinery onto the trucks, took it away, left the doors open. Eight days later, the hidden Jews just walked out the main gate. It's very important to note 
that among the the people who were hidden, some of them were diggers. They they enabled others to live, even though they did they themselves didn't come out of the tunnel. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, one last thing that I want to say before we say good night, and before I say thank you again, um, Tamara, there's a question about another reunion. Uh, yes. The families want another reunion. It's not enough. So that's a question uh, for you that I think you're going to have to answer at some point to everybody. Uh, so, Maiden, it's never enough. Uh, yeah. You know, reunions are a form, one of the forms, to keep the story alive. And this is a way, uh, This is a, these are meetings where we learn from people a lot and people connect their stories to the place. That's why as soon as the COVID is away, as soon as people tr start traveling again, let's do another reunion. And I am for that with all my heart. Wonderful. So we made a deal. And you know, I'm not from there. I am from Belarus, my family. So I'd love to come and visit as well. Uh, I want to thank our guests. Once again, I want to thank Michael Kagan for sharing his story about his, uh, through his father, his experience with his father and with Betty, with her incredible research, uh, finding the escapees and their families, even if they didn't know that they were uh, families, you gave them a gift of, uh, of history and heritage and a legacy. And Tamara, I wanna thank you for preserving this history, telling this story over and over and over again. If you just put Tamara's name in YouTube, you can find so many uh, tours that she does. They're amazing of the area, making sure that this uh, history of the Jewish community that was very strong and very present in Novogodok is remembered because as she discovered when she first came to Novogodok, that wasn't the story. And I wanna thank our uh, guests for coming. And for those of you who held out for two hours to be with us today for this amazing, incredible program with our guests. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and of course, for all our uh, Novogodok uh, family and community that joined us today and for Alan Bell that I see that joined us in the end, for Sophie that was here and I'm sure many, many others that you all know very well. Uh, I'm gonna say good evening, Laila Tov, good night. Thank you, someone said to Daraba, and uh, we'll see you soon.